Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, once again, uh, welcome to this event. And I would like to remind again each one that if uh, you're not speaking, you please uh, mute your microphone so that we can give uh, time to the speakers. Uh, once again, this uh, event is in partnership with the Social Ethics Society. I saw a lot of people here, our uh, chairman of the board, Dr. Ryan Mabolok, uh, members of the board. I, I saw uh, Professor Minilito Mansuito of MSUIIT. Uh, some others, uh, maybe later on, uh, they will be coming. And uh, some uh, philosophy professors from... Uh, not only in the in Mindanao, but in, uh, in Luzon, uh, Polytechnic University of the Philippines. Welcome to this event. But to formally welcome us, I would like to call our uh, Vice President for Academic Affairs to give us his uh, welcome message and opening remarks, uh, Dr. Kurt Anthony Diaz. Sir Kurt. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roger. Uh, before I proceed, can you hear me, Dr. Roger? Yes, I, I can hear you, uh, sir. Thank you. Uh, to the Dean of the Graduate School of Correso College, Incorporated, Dr. Alex Dimies, to the officers and members of the Social Ethics Society, headed by no less than Dr. Ayan Mabulok, Dr. Roger Bayod, my colleague and one of the lead organizers of this event. To the plenary speakers, Dr. Laini Hartzell of the ASEAN Institute Program of Energy, Economic and Environment, and Environment Berlin, Tokyo, and uh, Dr. Jochiro Tanabe of Waseda University of Japan, Plenary reactors, Dr. Cesar Texon and Professor Lorenzo Balili Jr., faculty and students of Correso College Graduate School, students from other universities throughout the world, other guests, friends, to everyone, a pleasant morning. One of the most important dimensions of learning in the graduate and postgraduate studies is the need for both faculty and students to be regularly updated with the current trends and issues happening and projected to happen at the national and international arena. Students pursue higher studies for many reasons one of which is to acquire more knowledge and skills that can help them perform and accomplish tasks expected from them. May it be as an employee or as a self-employed. And with the advent of technology, whereby industries are transformed at an exponential rate, and with the very challenging social, economic, political, and moral issues happening around, coping is becoming very difficult and even very demanding. Being aware of the latest issues and being skillful on the current trends can increase one's value, ability to cope, predict where the future is leading, and more importantly, increase professional contribution to the society. Successful people spend time every day keeping up with the latest issues, trends, and developments in their respective fields. It is in this context that I am very thankful to Correso College Graduate School, to the Social Ethics Society, to our plenary speakers and reactors for making this very relevant and responsive lecture series activity possible. What the speakers will be sharing to us in the next couple of minutes is an excellent avenue 
for graduate school students and faculty to learn and become updated on liberal and ASEAN perspectives, ethics of technology and ecology, and liberal environmentalism. To all of you, our dear participants, it is my hope that what you will learn from our speakers today, as well as from our reactors, will bear fruit no matter what your role is or what field your work in. To the graduate school, it is my prayer that you continue to organize events like this for the benefit of our faculty and students throughout the world. After all, for us in Corjeso College, it is our vision to develop our students, making them fully transformed persons. Thank you and again, good morning to everyone. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Diaz, for that wonderful uh, opening uh, message. Uh, before I will uh, call in our speaker, let me recognize uh, uh, some people here. Uh, Professor Al Kelyupi of NDMU, Anisito, uh, Professor Anisito Utilias of uh, Cebu Technological University, uh, Dr. Igia of uh, Yusef, and some others. So thank you very much for. Uh, participating. Now, uh, our first uh, plenary speaker, uh, Lane Hartshell, uh, PhD, is a research professor at the Center for Ethics in Science and Technology, Department of Philosophy, Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok, Thailand, and a research fellow at the Asia Institute Convergence and 3A program, Seoul, Co South Korea. He has held teaching research positions at Mahidol University, Sirijads Medical Center, Bangkok, Song Kyung Kwan University, South Korea, and the University of Virginia, Charlotte Sibel, Virginia. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Lane Hartzell. Uh, good morning everyone i can see the responses over here <clears throat> so i'm going to be the first speaker this morning is that correct obviously yes yes the professor from japan didn't uh, arrive yet the airplane's late okay well uh a good morning everyone i see some uh, clapping over here. I see some videos. Um, it's good if you turn your videos on so I have someone to look at other than myself in the bottom right corner. Um, and thank you to uh, Professor Diaz and uh, Professor Rogelio Bayod, uh, Faculty of Core Jesu University, Department of Graduate Studies, and for the opportunity, of course, to speak. And also thank you to the students and staff and others attending. I see there's quite a few. It looks like there's 200 in a, in a video call here. Um, and also to uh, thanks to others who wandered in off the street or wandered in from the galactic internet of the metaverse. Um, welcome and I'm happy to talk to you today. Uh, today I want to consider uh, with you the subject of this uh, uh, present paper that I've been working on uh, related to bioregionalism and civilization, particularly in the last uh, 70 years or so, and um, uh, covering the 70 years since the Second World, World War. And um, this, this time is known as what we call the Great Acceleration. I always have to do my watch here, so I make sure I stay within your, your time uh, constraints. The uh, so this great acceleration um, is kind of like a general term, but uh, usually these days it's known as the Anthropocene or the beginning of a new uh, geological era. Of course, there's, you know, there's a lot of debate on this because to determine a geological era, it takes a lot of strati you know, the strati stratigraphy, stratification of the, 
uh, sediments and so forth. So that's another topic. But anyway, we typically call this the Anthropocene, thinking that it probably started somewhere around the 1940s or 1950s. Uh, and it, in, in this particular event is uh, something I'm uh, putting in the context of human ecology in the bioregions. The bioregions are, for example, the bioregion I live in uh, has mountains and forests. Uh, another bioregion might be the sea and the uh, ocean and the coastal areas. These are various uh, general descriptions. Of course, indigenous people will know a lot more uh, closely about the bioregions, as do the indigenous people here where I live. Um, I call this a theoretical ecology <clears throat> for bioregionalism, and I draw from anthropology, archaeology, uh, climate science, classical literature, and so forth. But really, uh, this is a hypothesis I have until I can lay out the information for you today. And first, I should say, can everyone hear me clearly? I, I suppose I would get a message or Okay, good. Thank you. I see. I see the the, the emojis are getting even more uh, realistic these days. Okay, so let me start off with a survey of civilization in history. So, the modern term, it's, civilization is actually a modern term, and it's based on uh, civitas or uh, civil or the citizen or so forth. And this be this basically means the urban area or the city. Uh, more than, uh, there's some problems here, of course, more than uh, 2,000 years ago, for example, Mencius, the uh, Chinese philosopher, wrote, uh, if axes, the axes, you know, cut trees, are allowed in the mountains and forests only in the appropriate seasons, there will be no more timber that can be used. And he lamented that the trees on ox or new mountain in Chinese, were once beautiful, but being situated on the outskirts of a large city-state, the trees were cut down by the axes or with axes, and people supposed that the mountain was never wooded. But how could this be the nature of the mountain? And that's, uh, that he's writing there in Book 1A3 for the scholars here. Uh, he also went on to talk about wildlife and plenty of food, uh, turtles and so forth that they would eat. and. Um, the problem there, of course, is uh, kind of wanting to focus on you know, cutting down trees in that particular one. But there's another uh, example from Western civilization going back, in this case, when we're talking about uh, you know, urbanization and so forth, going back to the epic of uh, Gilgamesh. So Gilgamesh went down to the, uh, to the forest. He killed the forest guardian and uh, then felled the trees. And then the trees were, of course, taken back to the cities and so forth. And this was around the time of Europe. So we're looking at you know, somewhere around uh, 5,000 years ago. And then between Europe and you know, the time of Europe and then down to uh, Egypt, uh, you see this kind of uh, city-state or civilization coming about. So that's the background of the talk. I don't go further back into the uh, Neolithic time back to, say, uh, Gotep, Gobekli Tepe, but uh, this is around 5,000 years ago. Uh, later, writing in what is going to be of interest to you at Corhesu University, later writing in around 200 AD, that's 1,800 years ago, uh, Father Tertullian, the father of Western Christianity, said, surely it's obvious enough if one looks at the whole world, that it's becoming daily better cultivated and more fully peopled than anciently. All places are now accessible, all are well known, all open to commerce. Cultivated fields, fields have subdued forests. There are large cities and civilized life. What most frequently meets our view and occasions complaint is our teeming population our numbers are burdensome to the world, which can hardly supply us from its natural elements. Our wants grow more and more keen, and our complaints more bitter in all mouths, while nature fails in affording us her usual sustenance. But this is you know, almost 2,000 years ago. It sounds like it could have been written yesterday by a, an ecological philosopher. Uh, Father Tertullian, of course, didn't know about advanced technologies in the megapolises of today, uh, such as Lagos, Nigeria, Bangkok, um, 
Manila and so forth. Uh, but he had a more or less accurate idea of what was happening. And of course, uh, in the couple thousand years leading up to before Tertullian, uh, there was a cutting down of the trees and so forth around the forest, as I mentioned, uh, the forest around the Mediterranean. Um, so for modernity, jumping quite up to a number of thousand years here, what we see above is called civilization a term that was actually coined uh, much later, as I mentioned, and uh, David Wingrow, uh, an archeologist from, um, I think it's UK, maybe London School of Economics, I'm not sure. Uh, he, he writes about this, he wrote a book about this. Uh, there's, there are other versions of the way that people use civilization, of course, civilization as being a, a you know, techn technologically, culturally complex, uh, system, but the foundational aspect is the urbanization process. Um, the interpretation, of course, of the Latin and Chinese texts that I'm giving here uh, is an interpretation back on that time. As I said, they didn't have the concept of civilization, but they had the, the idea of what was happening, and that process is urbanization. Uh, so the major theme of this talk is, is such a system in comparison to bioregionalism. In the beginning of the modern era, the one we live in now, you know, if you want to call it postmodern, that's also, but in 1640, or in the 1640s, the uh, chief, uh, Miatinomo, in, in what is today the United States, uh, Miatinomo, chief of the Naragan set, said that we shall soon all be destroyed. You know, our fathers had plenty of deer and skins, and our plains were full of deer and turkeys. Our coves and rivers were full of fish. My interjection here is the civilized, and going back to Miatanomo, have seized our country. They cut down the grass with sighs and the trees with axes, uh, reflecting uh, um, Menches uh, some 3,000 years before this. Uh, this was the state of the indigenous person 300 years ago under the onslaught of civilization, and in this case, European. And most importantly, it's the, this, this, this de degraded condition that I'm speaking of that is pointed to by uh, anthropologists and economists today to describe why we want to have urbanization. So they're saying that this subsistence way of farming uh, or, or survival is um, you know, a degraded state for the human being and we want to have urbanization, of course, after uh, destroying the natural system. Uh, this is a kind of version of John Milton's, if you put out the eyes of the people and rebuke them for their blindness. The, uh, it's, this is a slander, of course, consciously made and repeated automatically within academia and modern society. Of course, it's ethnocentric view going back to Paleolithic and urbanist chauvinism that began more or less between the time of Uruk in Egypt and proceeded on up until today, which is look on the internet, in all the in scholarly journals, and on just popular commentary, um, until we have a global industrial megapolis system that is powerful enough to cause geophysical changes and be entirely destructive to the ecological system concerning life. Now, I don't need to lay out the logic here uh, for graduate students and uh, academics, it's uh, all known, in, including in the popular media today, mainstream media. Uh, I don't need to lay out logic concerning if we are life living within an ecosystem, if we destroy the ecosystem, we're going to end up destroying ourselves. Unless we are to consider ourselves disembodied beings, and perhaps we want to live in a computer somehow. Uh, they tell us that they want to have a singularity and that we will upload our consciousness into a computer, uh, complete sci-fi foolishness, uh, foolishness if it's taken to be seriously. Other than that, the ecological situation, of course, has been long known, and over the past 70 years, undeniable, as more precise measurement by scientists and activists in the environmental movement and global justice has brought it to the public. Not new to anyone here, I'm sure, in the uh, student body or the faculty. Uh, approximately, approximately 100 years after Miantonomo lived, uh, the Industrial Revolution, of course, was uh, coming on, 
in Britain with a steam engine and um, with coal, uh, increased mining of coal. Of course, the steam engine allowed for increased mining of coal. So you start mining coal, you know, the traditional way, just digging. You have a steam engine, you can increase the production of coal and so forth. Uh, as the Industrial Revolution was in significant growth, so now we're in the mid-19th century, the Swedish chemist Savante Arrhenius, along with others, had hypothesized that civilization is likely having an effect on the atmosphere due to the fossil fuels. Uh, in the early 20th century, it was reported in popular mechanics. Again, known. By the 1950s, it was um, obvious. Uh, it was a serious factor of the geophysical system. Geophysical system is the large functioning system, like the, the actual atmosphere, the oceans, and so forth, like these big kind of mechanical systems that we have. The biosphere, the ecological system, deals with biology and life. Okay, so those are different uh, variations that I'm talking about here. But when they talk about, when I talk about a serious factor, at that time in the 1950s, it was serious in the potential for profits, not in effects on people and species. For example, in an ad by an oil company, it alluded to the benefits of a warming climate. I mean, we're talking like you know, 60 years ago or something. Um, and then later by the fact of oil companies, again, knowing about climate change, buying up rights to land that was then under ice, knowing that it was gonna melt. In the short time from the 1750s, uh, or really more like early 19th century Britain to the 1950s globally, the technical system had produced enough emissions for serious geophysical change, what we know now. And it was around this time that the Anthropocene was currently thought, or is currently, as we think now, began. That's the definition of the Anthropocene, where the human uh, systems of technology are so powerful that they're creating uh, uh, irreversible changes, uh, massive changes. Now, of course, farming and agriculture created a lot of changes, right? And then going further back when we had um, uh, archaeobacteria and so forth and the oxygen in the oceans, this also created, um, that's like billions of years ago. But anyway, there's uh, living beings have been creating changes within the environment over time, it's just that the current particular type of changes that are occurring are so massive uh, as to be an existential threat. So that's that's really what I'm getting at. Um, the uh, what only need consider the plight of Pakistan last year for those that are at least uh, semi-conscious uh, carried over till today, as approximately one third of the country was underwater and 75% of the country affected. That's just a few months ago, last year. Uh, the time for recovery for Pakistan, I didn't look at the estimates, such as from the UN or uh, World Bank or IMF and so forth, uh, but the necessity of funds are tremendous and the uh, potential for the country to actually recover are, um, it will take either a long time or maybe not even recover. The clear mindset from the literature and evidence above concerning the biosphere is, quote, there shouldn't be anything left on the ground. We need everything that's out there. We log to infinity. In other words, we cut down all the trees. Because it's out there, we need it all now. Uh, this is quoting the CEO of a major timber company in the latter 20th century, echoing Miantonomo, uh, Mencius, Gilgamesh, but all of those people, of course, for different reasons. This person, the CEO of the major timber company that wanted to cut down essentially all trees, is celebrated. Of course, his is a theoretical idea, but this is the this is the intention. This person is celebrated and gave advice to uh, young people to be all that you can be, echoing the self exaltation and. Uh, uh, self-esteem movement of the last century. Uh, of course, the ideas and orientation against nature are all through history. I don't need to necessarily quote him. However, the 20th century technosphere is ex exponentially powerful. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, philosophically, 
new questions have arisen about how the human being fits into nature. I don't doubt that perhaps everyone in this, uh, unless there's children at the, the event, I don't doubt that all adults here at least, or teenagers, have um, thought about how do they themselves and human beings and species fit into nature these days with such a technological onslaught. Uh, by the mid 20th century, there came an imperative to either change how we interact with each other, basically how we get along, and I'm speaking here of thermonuclear war, of which at the present moment, it's the most dangerous time in history, according to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, due to the uh, nuclear confrontation of superpowers in Eurasia, and also between India and Pakistan. Uh, that's one. And of course, also we need to change how we relate to nature, climate change. Uh, so climate change and nuclear weapons, probably every year change back and forth between which one is the most uh, threatening. Uh, uh, I'm focusing on climate change today, but at the moment, nuclear weapons are the most um, dangerous threat that we have. Um, or we will proceed towards existential crises, expecting at least a form of those to manifest due to the confluence of major risks, hence existential convergence. Uh, the demands of civilization by now are beyond what the planet can produce, revealing a kind of presupposed metaphysical course of technology, something that uh, Ryan uh, deals with, Professor Ryan there, uh, philosophy of technology, uh, it cannot be met by actual extraction from quarrying rock, mining mineral, uh, minerals and materials, and biologics. At, uh, we can't meet the need of urbanization at concentrations that urban centers are demanding, uh, it, echoing Tertullian. It's necessary that a serious, ongoing, and widespread public dialogue occur, speaking of democratic discourse, to further integrate the uh, humanitarianism of global justice and environmentalism of conservation and natural regeneration. If you think about global justice, uh, someone like Thomas Pogge or Leif Winger, uh, Forster, um, and so on. And then environmental conservation, uh, John Muir, Rachel Carson, uh, Derek Jensen, so forth. Uh, so we need to turn towards uh, turn from a metaphysics of the machine to the metaphysics of organisms. That's that's Cohen and Munford, and I'll, I'll give some of the references that I have that so that you recognize the the names. Um, what I describe is the uh, core of my lecture today is this comparison between bioregionalism and civilization uh, concerning communities within the boundaries of nature. The anthropogenic geophysical effects that I spoke of, uh, uh, the core thesis there is that since World War II, a new epic has been proposed, um, Anthropocene, and it's based on the industrial civilization, and which includes nu uh, nuclear fallout. So nuclear technologies that were used at the time that we can now see. And uh, of course, there's plutonium floating in the atmosphere, enough that could kill every single uh, human being if it were to be, you know, theoretically uh, taken in. Uh, all of that uh, toxic waste that's coming from civilization and so forth is there in the background. But the central system of an industrial political economy and the technical system, uh, generally referred to as neoliberalism or market capitalism or versions of state capitalism. Uh, these are combined into a powerful large-scale technology into a civil, uh, civilizational techniques. Techniques being, uh, meaning the manner in which we apply technology. So uh, I make a distinction here. Um, a lot of, I know uh, Ryan speaks of technology as being neutral, I think, and a lot of postmodernism speaks of technology as um, not having any, I'm sorry, technology as not having any uh, particular um, neutrality or if it has uh, some kind of direction. Uh, I'm, I'm making a little bit more of a analytical distinction between technology as applied knowledge as neutral 
and then the manner in which we apply technology as a cultural construction. So I'd make a bit of a difference there um, to the postmodernists that is uh, cultural construction. Uh, so this particular system, of course, Mumford wrote about this in 19, going back to 1934 and a number of books such as Techniques and Civilization, The City in History and so forth. Uh, mega machine, he called it the mega machine, by the way, that you'll notice that in the readings. Um, it created this social, cultural, and civilizational decline. Again, I don't think we're in an incline, I think we're in a decline, and uh, collapse in some ways, uh, along with the potential existential risk. It's said that the urban system began with the necropolis and goes to the necropolis. I hope this is an Iris our trajectory, but the power of the current system and technology seems to be racing on such a trajectory, but this time global. It also seems to me that technology, while a part of the solution, is not going to solve the matter. Hence, the subject or process of technics uh, is, uh, ought to be applied uh, to be, a, a, well, the application ought to be a core matter of public dialogue. Uh, it's interesting when the archaeologists look at uh, urban centers, you know, uh, they, they look for the necropolis. And the reason is, is because you can see what kind of society it had. Did it have kings and queens and the royalty and all of this? They had, you know, these kind of burial type places. They also had this kind of monumental agri uh, architecture and, the, and they had agriculture. Uh, the the in interesting thing is, is that... Uh, what they find is it begins with a necropolis and it collapses later with a necropolis. So it's kind of like this, this, this massive um, influx of, you know, extracted materials to urban centers and this great buildup. Uh, then they call it like a golden age. You can take that for what it means. And then it collapses. Uh, that's a typical civilizational model because it basically outstrips the land base. The, uh, so, so the culmination of the industrial age and industrial society is spoken of now uh, is this new emergence of industrial civilization called the third industrial revolution and even a fourth. Uh, Jeremy Rifkin talks about the third industrial revolution and Klaus Schwab talks about a fourth. These are the high-tech digital age kind of systems that um, involve you know, biotechnology, nanotechnology, information systems, uh, artificial intelligence and robots, all of these kind of exotic things. But if you've been using uh, chat GPT, you can see um, that these are actually quite uh, pivotal or changing, in my opinion, for uh, society today. Uh, I don't need to point, it's not necessary to point to social media, say from the beginning around, I don't know, 2006, 2007, and with the smartphone and how much that's changed society. Think about that, but uh, with hundreds and hundreds of times of power and artificial intelligence. Um, the, these societal level technical innovations with planetary effects are based on the extraordinary power and proliferation of modern technology and engineering. With a specific kind of technique, say from the Corinth Canal, massive infrastructure, to the information superhighway of today, uh, this discovery uh, invention and innovation uh, directed into a mode of application of civilizational culture is the uh, this highly sophisticated impressive aspect that a lot of people talk about I don't find to be particularly um, healthy and I think that it should be addressed uh, and instead of a human ecology with an integral human species the current system atomizes the human being into an in individual, which is an abstraction, that per that is a purchasing and consumerist entity within a market society, and this market society, of course, claiming that the true understanding of human nature is what they speak of, and then combine that with powerful technology, subsuming the human into a an abstraction, um, you know, calculating buying consumerist entity. And there's some analytical data I want to share with you. It's been more literary or philosophical up to this point, relying on science, of course. Um, there's analytical data that 
it's quite surprising probably to a lot of you because it's uh, so big. The beginning of my talk, as I said, I went with the more literary part, but let's look at the numbers. Anthropogenic mass, this is, when we say anthro, that means, you know, the human man, uh, genic created. So the anthropogenic created mass by humans was 1,154 gigatons between 1900 and 2020, or 34 gigatons more than the entire biomass of the earth, where humans are only approximately 0.01% of biomass. Uh, that citation is coming from Venditti, the uh, researcher, and also Vakov Smil, uh, engineer. Uh, one example in this time period between 2011, this is of course recent, right? You know, just 10 years ago. 2011 to 2013, China uh, used 140% of the cement that the United States used in the entire 20th century, three years compared to 100 years. And again, these are fairly equally comparable because of the massive technical system. Uh, the, the, that, that, that comes from Swanson and Waters. The human energy expenditure, now get this, is, two, is 22 zettajoules across the, in, across the entire Holocene, which is 11,700 years. That's the Holocene, the, the epic before what we're in. And you'll recognize uh, uh, Go, Gobekli Tepe as the major uh, monumental architecture aspect there in southern Turkey, northern, you know, Syria, that, those areas, uh, monumental architecture that had formed uh, just after the beginning of the Holocene, after the last ice age. Um, so the, the 22 zettajoules of, of energy used during the Holocene, uh, where it is 60 percent of that has been human-produced energy consumed since 1950, the, the time that I'm talking about, the main time of this lecture. Uh, so most all of the energy used during the Holocene has occurred during, you know, almost during most of, a lot of our lifetimes, uh, or just before and since the World War. Uh, I hope that came across clear about the, how much energy has been used. Um, concerning individualism and self-interest, economic and population figures show that investment emissions, talking about the world's riches, uh, analysis of the 150 or so top investments that on average are emitting 3 million tons per year are more than a million times the average for someone in the bottom 90% of humanity. These are big numbers, uh, but it gives some perspective on what's going on. What might be a way forward now? Now that we've kind of at least I hope I have a fairly accurate view on, um, on what's going on you know, based on, you know, the scientists. Uh, what might be a way forward? Well, I propose the uh, rethinking, <clears throat> a reorientation, and I'm not the only one. I'm, I'm relying on Kirkpatrick Saley, uh, uh, Derek Jensen, Lear Keith, Max Wilbert, you know, going back to uh, John Muir and so forth. Uh, what might be a way forward is this uh, reorientation to bioregionalism. Uh, for this reorientation that I propose, and I have specific, I get specific later, the current imperatives and metaphysical project would have to change in order that human ecology is in harmony with the species and land base. Makes sense. I don't think there's any reason to question that unless someone is so ideologically gone that they think that the economy occurs uh, indoors rather than outdoors, which is at the core of economics today in the mainstream. By originalism with this political project of democratic process and the upholding of the integrity of the land and species, such as through rewilding, uh, agroecology, agroforestry, and combined with a reduction in extractive damage, and better development of advanced technology, all could be effective. Now, I'm not arguing uh, absolutely against technology. What I'm arguing is uh, that there needs to be a, a way to mitigate extraction. I, I don't know how to do that. I have to ask the engineers. 
I'm not sure if this even could be done at the level that needs to be done, which sets us on a course into a pretty dismal future. But I do think that there uh, should be some type of mit mitigation such that um, we can salvage as much as possible. Now, how might an ecological reconciliation occur? Because it's not just a material process, right? I, I'm, I don't think that uh, Karl Marx had the right idea when it comes to uh, material dialectic. It's kind of bas basically it's uh, you have material interacting until eventually you get people uh, getting PhDs. I don't think that this is a, the appropriate uh, uh, metaphysical argument. I would argue more from uh, analytic pragmatism or something like that. But anyway, the um, the issue here is reduction of extractive damage. How can that be done? That's a technical aspect. But ecological reconciliation is a social and political and economic cultural matter. Uh, people, as you know today, you know, and I'll speak from my country since I'm from the United States, uh, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of accusations going around maybe even on the verge of a low-grade nuclear, uh, sorry, civil war. Um, and uh, people are angry, they're, uh, they're upset, and they're also looking for ideas and new, new ways to do things. And some of it's quite crazy, way off in, you know, out of the solar system kind of thinking. But uh, anyway, I think that um, the, it, there, it is a time of upheaval and... Um, it is a time that people, I think, should come together and, 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 and discuss the major issues. In simple terms, there are a lot of good slogans that are out there today for engaging the public. And then, uh, of course, we need to create more public dialogue to go deeper. The, I usually talk about reduce, reuse, recycle. It's been around for a long time, decades and decades, half a century. Um, and I, I'm told by young people that this is a dream. Well, if this is a dream, then we're in trouble because this one is about as simple as it gets. Um, but I think you're right, of course. Uh, through engagement and innovation on what is already known, it may be possible to implement a degree of effective change. It makes sense to me. And with uh, momentum, mitigation of the problems might occur. The theoretical ecology is appropriate to the conditions philosophically. Of course, theoretic, theoretical ecology has a lot of mathematics in it, but I'm talking about you know, ecological philosophy. Uh, we have the knowledge, wealth, and organization to meet the challenges, uh, but my argument is more a kind of hypothetical or sci-fi in that I don't think these challenges are going to be met before serious breakdown occurs, referring back to Pakistan. Uh, just last year. Uh, hence, there is this kind of echo sci-fi element to my thesis, which I always uh, try to make mention of when I'm talking about technology and society. Uh, nevertheless, I'm serious about addressing the issues. These people, or many people, groups, so forth, would have to come together, of course. And the idea is to, to develop an accurate view on what's going on, but not just uh, continue on with the kind of debate and discussion but get into action uh, such as you know the large-scale movements that can create you know changes within the government and so forth uh, uh, policy uh, the effective uh, project for change I think right now to move to even a more pragmatic effective and um, economically feasible position is the global green new deal this is a uh, you know, of course, challenged on many ways, but it would be an outcome of the UN SDGs, particularly energy, that could provide an initial step in this direction, both for ecological integrity and for reconciliation, while at the same time, the foundational matter of civilization would eventually have to be addressed. Uh, one of the great challenges for this reconciliation within the Anthropocene, the term itself as I said, has neg negative connotations, materially and politically, is not only due to the enormous technological power, but because a small group of human beings, mainly the people from, say, my country, a uh, small number of people in rich countries, have caused these effects on the planet to the point that it's threatening everyone. Uh, the remote, however remote reconciliation seems to be, I mean, humans are a bit cantankerous, argue, fight, 
bad stuff sometimes. Uh, but uh, how reconciliation might come about is really going to be dealt with uh, at the uh, individual human beings level in their communities. There are going to be different ways to do it. Uh, that reorientation, of course, would be within bioregions, which we can see defined already by nature and not because we say uh, this is my country and that's your country and, um, you know, there has to be a division. The militaries will say there has to be a division, of course, but as you know, uh, pollution has no nationality and neither does this uh, kind of technological megapolis apparatus that's creating havoc in the geophysical system. These are not national issues. These are not uh, specific state issues. Uh, so an integral, integral democratic and ecological core would have to, I think, address these issues. This social and ecological reconciliation would be more effective than a continued focus on the Anthropocene and the technological imperative. Uh, you'll hear John Weckerts there in the background uh, on that uh, particular technological imperative that apparently that he says that we have in Western society, and I agree. Reorientation, design, qualified technologies as reconciliation can be implemented at the same time along with regenerative forces of nature. Now, we don't, I don't want to um, put too much of focus on technology because uh, nature has its own regenerative forces, and these are extremely powerful. It, I'm going to give two examples in a moment, but uh, probably for many people in cities, you know, uh, maybe 57% of the world's population lives in cities. And when you have levels of distinction, uh, I'm sorry, distraction and separation between yourself and nature, it's hard to see, you know, say what a bio, see and say what a bioregion region is. So for example, a child today grows up within this, this technological complex of steel and glass and uh, I have a visitor here beside me of uh, steel and glass, uh, concrete, and now uh, screens. So you have a screen in front of you uh, with a phone, then you have a television screen, and then you have a window, and then you have concrete and maybe some trees. And you, to even get outside of this, maybe you do this, um, I don't know about you there, but because a lot of you are indigenous, but the people in the city may go outside the city for an experience of nature, which is actually not, not an experience of nature. Maybe it's an aesthetic experience, uh, talking about the great um, Native American uh, historian and philosopher, Vin Delora. Uh, these are aesthetic experiences. These are not experiences of nature. So what I'm saying is, is that uh, this regenerative power of nature needs to be understood and people of course need to have more experiences of nature, but don't take my word for it. People in cities have just seen it. So I'm gonna give two examples that give empirical evidence to underlie this theoretical ecology I'm talking about uh, or philosoph philosophically. Uh, and these are systemic changes that might be a basis from going to theory going from theory to practice. Okay, so if you remember the Great Recession, I don't know how this could be even forgotten now, although the economists seem to have amnesia, everyone else doesn't. Uh, there was a decline, of course the recession hit, 2008 collapse, so forth and so on. There was a decrease in extraction. You'll see, as you see, the, the use of resources going up, it gets to around 2008, 2009, stops, comes down a little bit, but then around, when, once you get the stimulus and so forth, then on and up it goes again. I'm gonna use aluminum, copper, fossils, and so forth as examples. So uh, from around, uh, from between 2005 and 2019, there was an increase uh, use of aluminum, uh, even with an existing system of almost you know, full recycling that we have. The reason for this is because uh, high technology, things like airplanes and so forth, have to have new aluminum, fresh aluminum, aluminum, not recycled aluminum. And uh, then that requires bauxite mining, bauxite being the mineral and so forth. Uh, other examples include coal, fossil, copper, 
all requiring immense extraction and all uh, dramatically increasing. Just uh, last week or the week before, India mandated by decree that coal companies have to increase production of energy, burning more coal. That's a mandate from the government. Uh, this kind of thing, of course, I think India is going to be rising like China, or it already is, but you'll see it, you'll be able to see it, you know, in the mainstream media a lot more clearly. I think that's on the way. Uh, carbon, carbon emissions from aviation doubled between 1990 and 2019, okay, so taking airplanes, and the number of airline passengers, including uh, domestic and international, went from 0.8 billion people in around 1980 to 4.6 billion people before the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, everyone can fly, well, that's a problem. Uh, that's not, not a slogan that I want to hear. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is the next example empirically, and this one will be even more dramatic. As COVID-19 came on and uh, we at, at first governments didn't close down, uh, citing they wanted to keep the economy going. Uh, also, uh, some government representatives uh, citing the fact that if you're 70 years old, then you've had a good life, we need to keep the economy going basically saying we need to call the older people. And if you look at the CDC numbers uh, for COVID deaths around the age 45 to 55, you'll see COVID coming in at number five killer. Uh, for 55 to 65, it comes in at maybe number four killer for that age range and above 65, it's about like number three for killing. Now, COVID, again, was not a very, uh, dangerous virus compared to something that like like mares that could kill 10 percent of people the reason it's dangerous is because people that are already weak or vulnerable say with a health uh, condition or if they're older you know over 45 or 50 uh, these people could be killed or maimed there were now one thing you don't hear about is a lot of people were maimed from the virus uh, vaccines uh, I, I just a, a short story here uh, when I first started out in biomedicine, I was working in a hospital. Uh, I, I had, w was going around for the rounds with the doctors, and uh, I saw a that this time was a young woman who had received the vaccine. I can't remember which one it was, and she had been um, uh, maimed by a vaccine when she was younger. Now she was probably about 20 years old, but um, uh, had something that looked like cerebral palsy or basically inability to connect with the reality and other people. And it also had had uh, like kind of muscular effects on her. I don't doubt that there's dangers in uh, vaccines. Uh, but in fact, I just took, recently took a vaccine for uh, tetanus, by the way. So, I mean, I, the, 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 I, the risk levels and the, the dangers, I think, uh, from getting like a dangerous virus and it maiming you compared to a, a vaccine is a big difference. It, the risk of the virus are much higher. Uh, but if you're healthy, I don't. it doesn't seem to be a problem, the medical experts say. Uh, that was a tangent, but it, it ties back into uh, the, the idea of the pandemic and what's going on in society and understanding. But there's something even bigger than, than this. The immediate reaction a response from nature, if you want to call it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm personalizing nature here. But uh, if you notice, when the governments uh, closed down finally, uh, what happened? Wildlife showed up in the streets of the cities. The grasses, the flowers, everything out of control. Nature began its own version of bioregionalism that was visible, visible to regular cities creating the potential for new biopolitics. So there's not only a new biopolitics from COVID-19, the you know vaccines, pandemic, certainly more pandemics to come, but the other is uh, bioregionalism, natural regeneration. Part of it's just get out of the way. Now, I don't think just getting out of the way is gonna be the only way to solve uh, the urbanization. Uh, the scientists uh, also understand, uh, for example, when you put in a, uh, when you have you know, cut forest, clear-cut forest, you can only do it about two or three times. 
before it, you know, it's pretty much destroyed. And you have to go in and put tiers of, um, you know, trees in to, to rejuvenate the forest. I'm not going to get into details because I don't know them. But the, the issue is, uh, I think, clear. Can I see, will you just uh, give a show of hands of how many of you saw uh, this natural regeneration? If you're in this, if you're in Manila, uh, wildlife coming back into the streets, do I, do I see a show of hands Any or a thumbs up? Wildlife in the streets of Manila, um, you know, banana tree is out of control. <laughs> Okay, nobody? Is there nobody? Okay, I see. okay. So you did see. Uh, this happened all around the world. How about blue skies? Uh, another thing that happened. So, so take, for example, New Delhi, perhaps the most, well, you know, it, it, it oscillates between there, Bangladesh, and uh, China. But New Delhi had, um, you know, basically brown skies most of the time, and the skies are clearing up. You see a blue sky again. Uh, maybe if you're near the mountains, you can see the mountains. That's pretty interesting uh, regeneration. Uh, so I, I wanted you to take note of those as we talk about ways of uh, actually changing this. And uh, can somebody, uh, Professor Rogelio, can you give me a time limit here on my talk? Or someone, can you give me a time limit or just... Okay, uh, while, natural, while nature demonstrated this regeneration in direct view of much of the world's populace, the IEA argued for a, quote, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, obviously recognizing bioregionalism, for governments to move away from fossil fuels with a $3 trillion uh, dollar, U.S. dollar investment. Uh, also, quote, the relationship between humans and wildlife in urban settings changed during the shutdown and understanding the reasons for that change could inform urban ecology and conservation. That's Zelmer. Aside from the problematic nature of paying, of the public paying for free market innovations, for example, the iPhone is the is a core example, or Boeing Airlines is another, uh, as uh, Jensen talks about. The essential matter is all areas of civil society uh, that now have direct example empirical examples of what may be possible if an integral program of bioregionalism were to be implemented in society. Um, and that would be wildly, I, I call it a process of de-urbanization, de but I'm not talking about just uh, ending urbanization tomorrow, but using a kind of urban revillaging uh, to uh, create you know, a better urban environment, a better urban environment would be de-urbanized, and neo-bucolic regeneration for rural areas, uh, rewilding and so forth. These could mitigate and change exact extractive processes, okay? Now, uh, Rogelio, can you give me time? Can you show me, how, like on your fingers or something, how much time I have left? Um, that will let me know how much deeply I can go into solutions. You have about uh, 15 minutes. Okay, got it. Uh, that's perfect. No problem. Uh, so discussion and suggestions. Uh, as you can see, there's there's negativity, there's positivity, there's uh, real, uh, I think, genuine, empirically valid ways of moving forward, uh, things that can be done, uh, involvement, and so forth in people. So considering bioregionalism as the theoretical ecology, then it follows that a new techno-social and ecological reality might develop where the technologies that create the conditions for such a reality, reality are absolutely important to be considered and framed within this integral perspective that I'm giving, uh, particularly human ecology and global justice. Uh, this, this framework is what I'm talking about to provide a clarity needed for this complex, more humanitarian and ecological reorientation based on the pr pragmatic approach to working with how the earth regenerates. Sounds simple, and I think it is, uh, and we have plenty of understanding and know-how to, to do this. Uh, it's not going to be easy, um, but how we are affected as human be beings and a species is all becoming you know, quite known. Uh, so what is our relationship to culture, to nature, uh, and the future? Many look to the futurist to give us some clues However, 
much of uh, futurism, as you may have heard me allude to earlier, has this presupposition or bias of technological imperative, where I think that Mumford and Smith and Weckard are correct, uh, that the technological imperative is a problem, it's a metaphysic, uh, not bound to any kind of uh, material uh, you know, limits, which we have with physics, chemistry, and biology. And uh, what, while futurism is interesting in the freedom of speculation, so I like the sci-fi and all this kind of stuff, um, it should be encouraged. It is also important where our speculation is directed. Uh, free speech is fine, but it depends on where it's directed. For example, uh, let's say free speech is about, um, you know, entertainment. Well, that's fine. We should have free speech, but it also could be an abuse of free speech when we're not talking about serious issues of the day. Uh, so I think the criticism of free speech is also a matter of freedom of speech, something that the left doesn't get. Uh, but from the perspective on civilization, history, and ecology that I presented here, it's this uh, uh, land ethic, I think, that it might be kind of a way to put it more concretely uh, with uh, out of Leopold's work, uh, the intrinsic value of nature rather than just um, use value or commodity, and culture and scientific understanding of natural processes about how to design with nature. This is Ian McNegg and so forth and the uh, Lewis Mumford's teachers and colleagues. There is historic pre historical precedent of influence in the background, such as the confederacies of the indigenous publics. Indigenous village publics, many of you know, Rogelio, Professor Rogelio works uh, with indigenous villages. Those are indigenous publics. Uh, I have uh, five or six points here that I want to want to make. The first is the SDGs number seven of the SDGs. Uh, number seven is about energy. We have to move to a clean, uh, renewable energy system and with a social, political, and economic uh, a resistance and refusal to continue to cut trees and burn trees and to mine coal and burn coal so forth and so on. It's not going to be enough just to have fancy uh, photovoltaic um, systems, solar energy and so forth, I have them on my house, uh, without decreasing the use of fossil fuels. The other part is the um, Green New Deal that could fund such an energy transition. And it should be some type of distributed energy transition, uh, something maybe at the village level. Uh, some of my friends, including very intelligent people, very educated people, knowledgeable, send me uh, information about cold fusion, which is, um, I think it maybe operates for a couple minutes now, produces some energy. Um, I saw something like eight, eight, eight gigajoules recently. Uh, if these, these are interesting, but they still sound like sci-fi to me. And unless these are at, say, the village level, I don't think that they're going to be much to talk about. We'll see what happens. Um, so rather than a second fossil fuel regime, which is what we're getting now with this whole idea of green and renewable, we need an actual clean system. The next one is rematerialization. So I talked about earlier 1,154 gigatons of material artifact has been created by civilization. Uh, this, this is a material that we've made, things. Uh, human ingenuity, I think, uh, is not going to go away. I think that it should be directed in a better way towards using and uh, reusing what we already have or better techniques uh, and such a bioregional system in the direction of designing with nature, of course, would free up discovery, invention, and innovation for a rematerialization of making use of what's already available. Okay. Education, number three, education with an, edu with, with an ecological imperative. Um, you're doing this there. I don't need to really talk much about this, but open education for all to create the grounds for discovery and uh, innovation. Uh, increase open science. Make training for more scientists uh, uh, free or very low cost, affordable for people who want to learn and do science. Some people don't want to. That's fine, but make it available make opportunities available. 
uh, make specialized education accessible, increase uh, next increased restoration and rewilding. All of these are parts of education. Uh, regenerative ecology for primary schools on up to specialized vocational schools. Why not? The edible schoolyard has been known for decades. Uh, uh, I think uh, the owner, Chez Panisse, I forget her name, she started this edible schoolyard. Uh, the children plant their vegetables, they harvest their vegetables and so forth. Uh, number four, political ecology. A turn from urbanism to bioregionalism, core thesis today. From a mechanical fabric, quoting Mumford, to an ecological holism. These are not just fancy terms. I tried to lay out the ground for that in the speech. Uh, and urbanism, this is a slogan, urbanism is old bioregionalism as cutting edge. That's reversing the actual way that it's thought about as urbanism as uh, the leading the forefront of humanity and uh, the subsistence economies and those indigenous as being backwards. But and I think it's the reverse. Political, psychological, and spiritual reorientation. Uh, the other part of that is democratic process to enact a structure of rules and laws towards the eco society and thereby creating as much input as possible in order to achieve a clear understanding of conditions. A clear diagnosis leads to the best development of treatment. Uh, the I think everyone understands the, uh, the philosophical and um, humanistic type aspect, humanitarian aspects of democracy that the individual should be involved with, you know, how the rules are made in society. But the practical aspect of democracy is that you want as many people reporting back to the, you know, reporting within society of what's going on so that you get an accurate view of, of, um, of the external world, empirical reality. Uh, authoritarian systems or uh, totalitarian system, totalitarianism is just a, hyper authoritarianism. So I just use authoritarianism. But authoritarian system, you have experts, you have a core of, of authority, and it doesn't get a lot of feedback from the, the, the people, from the, from the entire society. Therefore, it can end up with a skewed view of reality. And of course, there, there's a kind of saying, I think this comes from Mark Twain in my own country, that a politician can't tell you where your shoe pinches your toes. Only you can decide that. So uh, we shouldn't have experts like me as uh, only politicians, or I'm not a politician, but I don't think that experts should be politicians necessarily, uh, only within a democratic role, but the experts should be uh, advising a democratic system for what's best to go, you know, to go. So I'm not calling for democracy, say, in the surgery. In the surgical theater, you want to have the surgeon and the surgical staff, uh, nurses, anesthesiology making decisions. What you want is this, the structure and the rules that govern the surgical theater using medicine, you know, of course. Uh, the rules and a system that governs the structure around the theater of where the surgeon works, or if you want to say a military commander, these should be under control of uh, democratic systems. Uh, I'm not for meritocracy, where you have the physicist uh, running the politics, for example. Uh, the, the other part is avoid green tyranny and technocratic authoritarianism, going back to what I just was talking about with democracy. Uh, the next is social and individual, reduce, reuse, recycle. I'm going to say that again. I like that. It's on the dumpsters out around where I live, actually. Uh, it's all known, and it's also on the refuge trucks that go around. Uh, urban greening, gardening, and wildlife rest restoration. This is a mass movement that's going on right now, and it's done by regular people like us, uh, such as like the Friends of Griffith Park in the United States. What they do is they record the raptors. The raptors are you know eagles, hawks, um, kestrel, and so forth. Uh, you know, how healthy an ecosystem is, you have to understand how the raptors are working. Okay, so they have this uh, kind of open science project. Rural regeneration or neo-bucolic regeneration of the land. Uh, being a, a Christian Catholic university, you of course know who Virgil was and who wrote about a bucolic life. Uh, I'm not advocating quite to, for that kind of uh, 
level, but I am advocating for a, uh, a more advanced technical neobucolic regeneration of the rural areas. And uh, Vanana Shiva has been doing a lot of work on this. You, you know who she is. Agroforestry, agroecology, horticulture, and so on, moving away from uh, what we know as agriculture, which is a monocrop. Uh, integral simplicity. This is a person's chosen way of a life way. It's not a lifestyle, it's a life way in a biotic or bioregional community. The biotic community, if you look around, um, for example, where I'm living, there are water buffalo, there are eagles, there are cobras, you have to watch out for them, they all fit in. Um, but there's a kind of simplicity in living that uh, comes with the enjoyment of the flourishing of culture, cu cuisine, um, intellectual and artistic flourishing, scientific, uh, political, and even enterprising endeavors. All of these are fine. Integral simplicity is an extension of the simplicity from the pragmatic naturalists, particularly kind of this tradition I come from in the United States, Henry David Thoreau, uh, Miantonomo, the indigenous and so forth, uh, and large-scale humanitarian societies up to our times. And then finally, economics. Uh, Yochi Binkler at Harvard writes about the wealth of networks and something that a lot of young people know that you can start out with a few people using some kind of open science thing. Uh, it's interesting, but when you start getting this kind of network effect and you get all of this kind of interaction happening, there's, there's no linearity there. It becomes this kind of hyper um, developing exponential kind of thing. Now that can work in the reverse, you know. Uh, disinformation, for example, also can uh, result from that. But anyway, uh, the, the network effect and the wealth of networks to build true wealth uh, is a really interesting concept that uh, Benkler has. Um, distributed digital manufacturing. Now I'm going to go into sci-fi here. I'm going to be criticized by uh, uh, eco philosopher Derek Jensen probably on this one. But I think that uh, moving from uh, the kind of manufacturing that we have today, which you know is factory-based and so forth, into desktop manufacturing or meta-local production, what I call it, uh, because it's resource efficient in materials due to localization, and there's a, subs there's a subsequent decrease in transportation logistics. So if going back to urbanization, the process of urbanization is the movement of these uh, this massive extractive process and transportation of resources into urban centers. It, either we have to get rid of urbanization, civilization, or we have to cut this extractive chain. It may be possible that we can cut this extractive chain through localized metalocal production. So you have on the internet, you have all of the uh, blueprints, design, knowledge that can be shared anywhere. You can have physicists and designers in Palo Alto working with um, a village there where you work or something like that. And then uh, you have local culture uh, infusing this uh, information and design system and get meta local production. I, I actually, I don't doubt this is, isn't already happening. You may not know it, but you know, some of the things that people are doing in villages are quite remarkable. Um, the, two major aspects of revillaging, which is what I'm talking about. So there's revillaging, the urban revillaging, which is more important, but of course the neo-bucolic uh, revillaging that I was talking about is uh, equally important, but in another way. But the urban system is, I think, what we need to look at. Uh, it, it's probably easier to understand the fact of the neo-bucolic because nature is largely visible. If I go to a school in the rural area, like where I live, uh, children are, they, uh, my, my little nephew, he, he herds the water buffalo, he rides water buffalo, he feeds them, He's, he participates in the birthing, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Again, I'm not saying that herding is necessarily good, but what I'm saying is that he understands these processes. But if I go to a city, I've actually heard children say they hate nature because it's dirty. 
uh, and you know so forth, and that their food comes from the supermarket and not from nature. These are some of the issues that I think that need to be addressed, uh, uh, but easier to see within a uh, within the village system. But since you know we're pushing like 60% now of people living in urban centers, and this is going to be, or at least the UN says, upwards around maybe 70 or 75% by 2050. That's only what uh, 20. 27 years so forth from that now uh, when you have that many people in urban centers there'll be even more disconnection from land and I think that that would almost be a terminal situation but anyway uh, uh, what I'm talking about with urban revillaging if you think about the blocks where people live and the districts already in place people and the neighborhoods these can be revillaging within an urban setting if you go with say the urban gardening uh, movement maybe even revolution and uh, you know regeneration and so forth again a meta local type production you can go on the internet and connect with other agroforestry uh, indigenous groups la via campesina in fact i think la via campesina is going to be the activist group and uh, movement that saves us uh, connect with these people to learn about and share ideas about technology and application and of course you know apply that where you're at the um this urban revillaging although i get from the indigenous people uh, uh is core to an idea remarkably enough people are going to say but i agree with a lot of republicans uh this idea is a Republican idea and movement from the United States, particularly Ronald Reagan, who, who ran on this particular, this was part of his community uh, regeneration and organizing that he had to become president. So Ronald Reagan was a major president in the United States uh, who ran with this kind of um, ticket, this kind of idea with this community organization. Uh, uh, Kirkpatrick Saley, is another that has the same idea, but his ideas for politics and Reagan's would be totally, you know, opposite, juxtaposed. But what I'm saying is, is that even if we have completely opposite political views, isn't it interesting that the actual political, uh, actual uh, political, and social application comes down to connection between human beings and nature? I think that that's a common point where you can bring together people to talk. Uh, different in politics, the pra practical aspect is similar, if not the same, the imperative is clear. I want to end there with that statement and take questions. Um, uh, I look forward to it. Questions can be anywhere from philosophy to uh, the applications I talked about, thanks. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Lane. Uh, of course, uh, later on there will be uh, open forum. But before that, it's good to also hear a reaction from a colleague who is an uh, expert in technology at the same time also uh, practicing a farm. Uh, a colleague of mine in the graduate school. Uh, we yes. have here uh, Dr. Cesar Tixon. Okay. Boss, uh, yeah, it's your time. Okay, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks to Dr. Hartzell for sharing to us a very valuable and remarkable inputs on bioregionalism and ethics of technology. Well, actually, at first, uh, it, it was very tempting on my side to conclude that uh, bioregionalism is anti-globalization. <laughs> but as it went along, it was made clear, as it was well articulated, that this paradigm is more on of coming up with the right equilibrium, like a bottom-based globalization. Such a new way of defining boundaries, no? which is largely, if not mainly, based on natural characteristics rather than just arbitrary human-made borders such as biopolitics no? to support industrial civilization or urbanization. Therefore, as an organizer or a mover of this philosophy, I can see that the focus then is to find solutions to the world's challenging issues by using bioregions to break large issues to a local level creating, or shall we say, magnifying solutions that's already been practiced in a community. Thus, create accessible pathways for every person living in the region to be able to somehow get active about issues that care that they care about. 
So then in the aspect of technology being seen as neutral, we've seen how powerful it is as an enabler to do either for something good or something bad. And from the words of Dr. Hartzell earlier, technology provided and continues to provide irreversible changes. So that is even why in the present day, with the continuing advancements, there is this big question of, question of how do human beings fit in nature? And that's beautiful. That's a very nice question. So in other words, it is not automatic that because we are using technology, it won't create problems. Well, in fact, uh, an inappropriate use of technology would even pose more harms and dangers than the solutions it offered. Hence, even the selection and implementation of technology should undergo an appropriate process of evaluation because technology, uh, in some aspects, can be regarded as invasive, intrusive, or even pervasive, especially when we talk about culture and traditions. Now, impacting the culture definitely affects the future and influence, uh, sorry, affecting the nature and definitely influences the future. So in this context, it calls for careful use of technology in supporting social advancements in such a way that uh, it will not only preserve, but more importantly, support and empower the essence of bioregions. So once again, thank you very much for the valuable information shared to us this morning, Dr. Hartzell.